Uh, thank you for the introduction. So today, in the next 20 minutes, I'm going to be talking a little on the background of prevention of sudden death in heart attack survivors, and then also going over some of my current ongoing research into this area. Clearly, I'm an academic clinician, a clinical researcher, but obviously presenting in this sort of translational conference, I'll be very keen to get any input from the basic researcher um, arena. So just to go over briefly, what exactly is sudden cardiac death? So sudden death, we can define it as any witnessed instantaneous death, even without documented cardiac arrhythmia, or um, unwitnessed death if the patient had been seen well within 24 hours with no other overt cause identified. However, what I'll be talking about in this presentation is true sudden cardiac death, which is really death due to ventricular tachyarrhythmia. So I'm talking here about ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation, which you can see nicely illustrated in the two telemetry strips beneath you, VT on the left and VF on the right. And when we think about who is actually at risk of sudden cardiac death, a lot of people will think immediately of the young athlete with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy who dies suddenly on the, on the sporting field. However, while this is a cause of sudden death in patients who are less than 35, the vast majority, more than 80%, actually occur in patients who have either had a heart attack or have underlying either diagnosed or non-diagnosed coronary artery disease. And in patients who have had a heart attack, sudden death is actually the commonest mode of death and the majority concerningly occur after the patient has gone home from hospital. So I'm just going to have a little bit of a story here, a hypothetical case example, just to show what we're really trying to prevent. So Mr S, he's a 56-year-old father of two, minimal background history, and he comes to Monash Medical Centre with an acute myocardial infarction. You can see here clearly there's ST elevation in the anterior lateral leads which indicate that he has an occlusion of his proximal LAD artery. He's brought to our cath lab, we put in a stent, and he's then on the ward where he undergoes a transthoracic echo, which shows that his pumping action of his heart or his left ventricular ejection fraction is reduced at 36%. But he's otherwise very well, he doesn't develop heart failure, he's put on all the appropriate, anti, um, um, on all the appropriate medical therapy and he's discharged day five. Now, 30 days later, as he's running to catch a bus, he suddenly collapses. Now, luckily for him, it's witnessed. A, C a bystander starts CPR. However, he has 14 minutes of downtime. By the time the ambulance arrives, he's in VF. He receives multiple shocks. He's intubated, resuscitated, and taken to the nearest hospital. He then goes to intensive care, and the usual outcome of someone who has an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, he does develop cardiogenic shock, renal failure, kidney failure, and pretty poor <coughs> neurological outcome. So this is really what we're trying to prevent. And why does sudden death occur in this patient who's had a myocardial infarction? And the reason for this is that he can develop a re-entrant circuit, which then leads to ventricular tachyarrhythmia. And if we look, for example, at some autopsy studies, we can see that changes in the left ventricle occur very early after a myocardial infarction. So by day five, most myocytes in the infarct core have died, and this leaves a subendocardial layer or border zone of surviving myocytes. And it is this area of infarct scar, so you can see in this illustration, this is an electrical study or an EP study. The red zones correlate with infarct um, scar or dead myocytes, and the yellow zones correlate with the peri-infarct area, which has patchy areas of either necrotic myocytes and also surviving myocytes. And it's these areas that create slowed conduction to the electrical, um, the electrical pulse that goes through the left ventricle. And this can then lead to areas of conduction block, and this for leads to the formation of re-entrant circuits. And if you combine this with an arrhythmogenic trigger, this patient can develop ventricular tachycardia or fibrillation, and then have sudden cardiac death. And some earlier ovine pig models that we performed back when I was at Westmead Hospital, this was published in Circulation, showed that these re-entrant tachycardia circuits actually form very early after a heart attack. So if you induce a heart attack in a pig model, you do an electrophysiological study and you induce one of these life-threatening arrhythmias, you then bring these pigs back and you repeat the electrophysiological study, the same circuits are seen in more than 95% of the case 100 days later. And why is this such an important issue? The reason for this is that it, it 
that sudden death or out-of-hospital cardiac arrest accounts for a huge number of deaths in Australia and worldwide. For example, in Australia, over 20,000 adults per year either die suddenly or have a non-fatal cardiac arrest, and more than 300,000 Americans per year. And even, like the case that I've illustrated, even patients who have a witnessed, shockable, sudden cardiac arrest, only 30% of those survive, and even less survive with good neurological function. So really the key is prevention in this, in this arena. And we have a very effective primary prevention tool, which is the implantable cardioverted defibrillator. So this was introduced into medicine back in the 1980s, and it's an implantable cardioverted defibrillator with a lead placed into the right ventricle with the ability to deliver a shock if that patient develops a life-threatening tachyarrhythmia. Back in um, 1996, the MADOT-1 trial was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, small number of patients, and they looked at patients who had had a heart attack, who had reduced cardiac function as defined by a left ventricular ejection fraction less than or equal to 35%, and also a positive electrical study for these inducible arrhythmias. And they found that if you put in a defibrillator, this is primary prevention before patients have suffered a cardiac arrest, they had a huge absolute reduction in mortality of 23%, and you only needed to put in four defibrillators to prevent one, to pre prevent one death. The MADOT 2 trial then came out a little while later, also published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and this time they didn't use an electrophysiological study, they used just an ejection fraction. So they took patients who had had a heart attack, who had severe impairment of their left ventricular ejection fraction, and they randomised them either to receive a defibrillator or standard medical care. Now once again, they did show a significant mortality benefit by putting in a defibrillator, but now you needed to put in 15 defibrillators to prevent, to, to, to save one life. Now, these two major randomised trials, as, long, as well as a few others that I don't have time to, to illustrate today, led to the current primary prevention of sudden death guidelines. And these guidelines, which are utilised around Australia and also internationally, state that if you've had a myocardial infarction, a heart attack, you can receive a defibrillator to prevent sudden death if you are more than three months after revascularisation. And keep in mind, the majority of our patients who've had a heart attack are now revascularised if you have a left ventricular ejection fraction less than or equal to 35% with heart failure or less than or equal to 30% with no heart failure. So this is severe impairment of your heart function after a myocardial infarction. However, there's a few issues with these guidelines. And the first issue is that the risk of sudden death after a heart attack is actually highest in the first few months after an MI. One such study which illustrated this was the Valiant trial. Now this was a very large randomised trial, more than 14,000 patients, and it was originally designed to look at um, Valsartan, Captopril or both in patients who had impaired heart function after a heart attack. And what they found is that the risk of sudden cardiac death or, or out-of-hospital cardiac arrest with resuscitation was significantly higher in that first one month after a heart attack and then declined exponentially after that to about six months after which it plateaued off. So in the first month after a heart attack, even patients with very impaired LVEF, the risk was about six to seven times higher than if you waited three months. So the current guidelines exclude patients who are early after a heart attack, despite the risk of sudden death being highest during this time period. And in reality, in a real life setting, patients often are deferred even longer because the guidelines state they need to be on optimal medical therapy and they need to have a reassessment of their EF. Now, in terms of the trials that actually show a benefit of defibrillator, they're really incorporating patients who are a long time after that MI. So the, the trials that I've presented looked at patients who are really about 18 months after a heart attack, and they showed a benefit of a defibrillator. So we really haven't looked at, had a positive trial that looked at this early time period. Now, a, a few trials that I don't have the time to go over in detail have looked at patients early after an MI, but they incorporated a few different risk stratification tests that found patients that probably were at risk of heart failure death rather than arrhythmic death. So the second issue with the current guidelines is that using a cutoff of a heart function or a left ventricular ejection fraction is not sensitive nor specific for detecting patients at high risk of sudden death. 
And we can see, once again, looking at this large randomised valiant trial, whilst patients who have that severe impairment of that ejection fraction are at the highest risk proportion-wise of sudden death, an equal and slightly higher 51% of all sudden deaths actually occur in patients who have a more preserved ejection fraction, purely because the numbers of patients after a heart attack in, with this more preserved EF is much higher. And so by just targeting ejection fraction patients less than or equal to 30%, we're missing more than half of patients who are going to die of sudden death. The other difficulty with this is that it has poor specificity. So if you put a defibrillator in based purely on an ejection fraction, the minority of patients receive an appropriate um, shock or a therapy from their defibrillator. And the reason for this is that if you have a low EF, you're both at risk of dying suddenly and also at risk of dying of heart failure complications. So the best risk stratification test would ideally identify patients who are going to live long term without heart failure, but who are at high risk of dying suddenly. So what are the other tests that we can use? So a lot of my thesis work has been into looking at electrophysiological study. Now, EP study for us non-cardiologists is, is a study that really looks at the electrical substrate for the re-entrant ventricular tachyarrhythmia that I've shown in some of those initial um, diagrams. And it has been shown to consistently predict patients who will have a rhythmic death in both observational and also randomised controlled trials. And the way that we do an EP study is that we place a right vent an RV catheter or a right ventricular catheter um, into the heart via the, ve the femoral, ve femoral vein and we can then stimulate the heart with extra beats uh, identified in this diagram here to try and bring on ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. And here this diagram demonstrates a patient that had ventricular tachycardia shown down in the bottom right of the screen. And the idea is that patients who have inducible ventricular tachycardia after a heart attack, this shows that they have a re-entrant circuit and are more likely to die of sudden cardiac death. And a few studies which have been published as part of my thesis demonstrates that if you look at EP positive patients after a heart attack, they have a significantly higher rate of sudden death or non-fatal arrhythmia compared to patients who are EP negative. In fact, we went on to show that if patients have a negative EP after a heart attack, despite having a severe impairment of their heart function, their survival is extremely good and quite similar to patients with a preserved ejection fraction, despite not having a defibrillator. The other test that has a lot of exciting potential at the moment in terms of prevention of sudden death is cardiac MRI. Now, cardiac MRI is a test, uh, a non-invasive non-invasive imaging test whereby we can give delayed gadolinium and we can highlight the scar anatomically of the left ventricle. And using specific techniques on the cardiac MRI, we can identify both the infarct zone and also this peri-infarct zone of surviving myocytes. And it's these areas that are postulated to provide the substrate for ventricular tachyarrhythmia. <coughs> And there's been several smaller observational studies that have correlated this infarct scar size and also the peri-infarct zone, both with inducible tachyarrhythmia on the EP study and also with either mortality or sudden death on follow-up. So moving along to what we're currently doing. So at the moment, we've um, started a very large international randomised controlled trial, the study protocol of which we published in Heart, Lung and Circulation last year. And the idea is that we want to assess primary prevention of sudden death early after myocardial infarction. So like I said, this is an international randomised controlled trial. Over 1,000 patients will be recruited and randomised to one of two arms. So the intervention arm undergoes electrophysiological study and ICDs are implanted only if we see this inducible tachyarrhythmia versus our standard care, which currently is medical therapy and a defibrillator implanted later. And we're also going to do a cohort of cardiac MRIs to try and correlate this with, with the primary endpoints. So the primary endpoint of the PROTECT ICD trial is to assess if early EPS-guided prophylactic implantation of a defibrillator following an MI will lead to a significant reduction in sudden death and non-fatal arrhythmia. And also to once again correlate that cardiac MRI with its predictive value for inducible arrhythmia EP and also sudden death at follow-up. <coughs> 
So the trial protocol illustrated here will be recruiting patients who have had either a STEMI or a non-STEMI, so an MI, they, who've undergone assessment of their ejection fraction within the first few days after the heart attack and randomising them either to our EP guided arm or to standard care. And in both arms we'll be performing cardiac MRI. So patients who have inducible ventricular tachycardia at the EP undergo have an ICD implanted, whereas if they have no arrhythmia induced, irrespective of what their ejection fraction is, they don't have an ICD. And we compare this to standard care purely because in today's um, age, we can't compare it to a control arm of patients who don't necessarily receive a defibrillator. So in the standard care arm, patients can undergo standard medical therapy and an ICD implanted after the 90-day period if their EF is still less than or equal to 30 or 35 per cent. So the end point of this trial is a combined one of non-fatal arrhythmia and sudden cardiac death and we'll also be looking at the usual secondary MACE endpoints. In terms of the trial management, we've got um, collaboration between myself at Monash Heart, Westmead Hospital, the George Institute for Global Health, who are doing a lot of the trial management database um, monitoring, and also the Baker IDI, where um, Professor Andrew Taylor is overseeing the cardiac MRI aspect. And we're aiming for over 30 centres in Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, Europe, Malaysia, and also we're moving to the United States at the moment. So, so far, the trial is up and running. We've recruited uh, the current sites listed here, and we've got over 171 patients, um, of which 21 have come, uh, uh, so sorry, 18, sorry, from Monash Heart at the moment. And we're putting in all the ethics approvals currently to get uh, the trial up and going in the United States and also a few European centres. So just going back to the initial hypothetical case. So the idea of this trial is that if we had that similar patient, Mr S, after he received a stent for his anterior MI, he would have an inpatient assessment of his heart function. Once again, shown to be 36%, current guidelines would implicate that he should be discharged home on optimal medical therapy, that he would have a cardiac MRI. If that identifies either a large infarct mass or a grey zone mass, then he undergoes electrophysiological study. And once again, if that is a positive result, he could have a primary prevention defibrillator early after his MI. So then when he runs for the bus day 30, his ICD would detect the ventricular tachycardia it could give him effective ATP pacing to terminate the VT without necessarily delivering a shock. And otherwise, he probably wouldn't even notice that he'd had an event, apart from the fact that his home monitoring would send an alert to his treating physician and he would return for early follow-up. So in conclusion, sudden cardiac death is one of the most common causes of death in heart attack survivors. And to prevent this, we can, we have an effective tool, which is the implantable cardioverter defibrillator. However, we do need to find ways to address the current limitations in the guidelines to enable prevention of sudden cardiac death early after MI. And if our PROTECT ICD trial is positive, we do have the potential here to both change clinical guidelines and potentially save a large number of lives. So thank you for your attention. Any questions?